Good afternoon. How y'all doing? Great. Great. Surviving. Thriving. Woo. Woo. Um, so this is a. Uh, I'm going to give a talk in a con about a conversation and uh, an epistolary project. And I, I hope it's a conversation. Um, I'm not going to be quizzing you all the time, but it's the end of the day. It's the end of the week. So hopefully uh, you can relax a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself really quickly. I'm uh, the executive director of Global Voices, which is a large community of digital activists, bloggers, and translators, from, mostly from the global south. Um, we look at online conversations, social media sources, and for over 10 years have been producing uh, stories for global audiences out of local, uh, local stories that the people in our community feel um, matter or should matter to people elsewhere in the world. So we try, to, we try to bring ideas of bridging or connectivity to global news rather than othering or sensationalism as our primary approach. And we do that a lot through language, a lot through translation. There's about, we translate from about 170 languages and into about 40. Um, we also do a lot of work with uh, uh, online freedom of expression and uh, digital inclusion for communities that have structural disadvantages to online participation. Uh, this is just the home page of our advocacy site, um, which is all about digital rights, online freedom of expression in the global south. Uh, so Global Voices grew out of blogging world, and um, most of you guys probably remember what a blog is, right? Blog. It's a pretty ugly word, actually. It's kind of homely, right? It's blog. You know, it's, there's a lot of, it's, it's roomy. It's like there's, there's a lot of room in blogs. And they're, they're kind of, they're, I don't know, they're kind of, they're kind of scruffy. They can be late. Um, they're not very orderly a lot of the time. Well, um, you know. I don't know, does anybody here still have a blog besides me? <laughs> Blogs, anyone? A few? Got to still, still have a few. Ever, ever done a wander through a WordPress theme space? You know, there's a lot of really bad WordPress themes out there. A lot of really, like, if, they, if we ever have a question about whether, um, whether we should be designing for narrow affordances or, like, thinking about how to organize our, 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 our plans for some kind of preconceived idea of how we should speak, well, like going into a wander in WordPress themes should correct that notion pretty quickly, I think. Um, and uh, so I've, you know, there's been a number of talks, and I think especially the last one, uh, which, which you very eloquently spoke about, um, why we what are we designing for and how do we uh, match the kinds of stories and the kind of technology choices that we make in order to um, not just say something, but actually have some kind of reason or logic behind the words or the ideas that we're putting into the world. Unfortunately, language is that lovely sloppy space where we can do that even if the technology doesn't work. Um, blogs did give us a couple of really wonderful tools, though, uh, for conversation um, that we don't really get very much in social media anymore. The beloved hyperlink, which was a two-way signal in blog worlds, because when you link to somebody, you always got a you got a ping back saying, "Hey, somebody linked to me," and that was always very exciting, because then you that was the origin point for a conversation. The digital echoes that tell us that somebody's on the other side of the signal, and um, most of the social media platforms that we have today, and at Global Voices, we spend a lot of time trying to derive stories or find stories. In, that, in those social media spaces because people don't blog anymore. Um, uh, it's really hard to find, I feel like so much of the, of the, the function of that kind of hyperlink is now a single, a single path, it's a broadcast, it's a mini broadcast, that's a little shout into the void and there's nothing back. And it, it frustrates conversation, it frustrates engagement. And I don't mean engagement in the corporate way. I mean, like, I want to talk to somebody, and nobody seems to pay attention. And, um, and people fall silent because of that. So um, I've been thinking about that uh, a lot in different ways. And earlier this year, um, I got to know a fellow uh, digital, uh, excuse me, a conceptual photographer in Belgium named Anton Kusters, who is on the program but couldn't make it today uh, all, the way to, all the way from Belgium. And um, we started, he's also a book designer and was the co-founder of Burn Magazine, 
which is a photographic magazine, photographic photojournalism documentary, online journal, and um, describes himself as a rabbit hole jumper, which I didn't understand for a long time because I thought he meant he jumped over rabbit holes rather than into them. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so he's been, An Anton and I started talking about these questions and, and we had a couple of good conversations and we thought, you know, this is, a, this is a good conversation. How can we continue it? And a few years ago, we would have linked to each other's blogs. We both, we, we both still have them, but that seemed inadequate. And uh, so we started bouncing around the idea of um, stripping down the notion of that kind of conversation to what we could think of as its, its most essential form, which is an epistolary conversation, an uh, uh, exchange. So I'm, I'm gonna show you a little bit about what he does, a little bit about what I do, and then I'm gonna dig into that project. Um, <clears throat> he's, uh, he's done a couple of, um, he's a book artist, and he's made a, a great book about the Yakuza. Uh, his current project is called the Blue Skies Project. He's spending, he spent the last three years driving all over Europe, visiting every single concentration camp in Europe and photographing three Polaroids above it. The sky has to be blue when he does it. He's, been, he's made it to 800 of them so far. Um, and so he's got this kind of endless journey in which he can set, set himself a conceptual path and that's like breaking his body as he's doing it. It's always dangerous to like get what you ask for with those kinds of projects. You know, it's really hard. Um, so like a, um, part of that has driven a conversation that we've had about the nature of memorialization and objects. Um, why is it that when we think about conflict and war, we build statuaries, we build um, kind of concrete objects that are descriptive in form rather than um, perhaps associative or conceptual. And of course here in the US we have Maya Lin who's taught us that there are other ways of doing that um, and that's Anton's attempt. Um, uh, in addition to Global Voices, I also uh, make books and take pictures and um, make interactive art documents and this is uh, an example of a, a book I published a few years ago. It's um, a two volume book, a book of writing and a book of photographs about Central Asia and Siberia uh, done over seven years. Um, and here's another, uh, just a, a screenshot from a, a nine channel interactive installation that I, about urbanism in Karachi that is uh, built in processing um, that's uh, going into traveling in museums now. Um, so, Anyway, we started, we've, we've had that conversation. And uh, we came up with the idea that we wanted to um, <clears throat> not constrain ourselves by technology at the beginning. So we wanted to just have, uh, not have to build something new and to use very basic existing platforms and figure out a way to have a conversation that kind of could re-energize or kind of still or quiet the freneticism of social media. And, um, and we started thinking about an inductive process or a, a weak or a weak narrative or um, open-ended storytelling process that would, would proceed point by point or image by image towards some direction that we didn't know. So we set some very basic constraints for ourselves. We decided to use Instagram with a hashtag that nobody was using and then we would republish on our own blogs for a chronological approach and the Instagram um, Character set, if you don't know, gives you 2,200 characters, so that, that constrains the writing. Um, and that's what that says. So I don't have to read it to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've been doing this now for since May, and uh, it's, um, it's on the Instagram feed. It's... Uh, all, all of the posts are available, though Instagram, as we've noticed, doesn't actually give you any kind of chronological sorting when you do a search, and so that isn't necessarily the best way to approach it. Um, um, instead, uh, and here's a quick snapshot of the roughly 48 images that are available as of two days, three days ago. Um, I'm not going to show you the whole project. If you guys are interested in looking at it, you're welcome to. Um, I will. Uh, maybe read one or two passages and uh, talk a little bit about um, about how the project has evolved and what we've learned from it. Um, and thinking about, uh, on the one hand, practicing some, or thinking about making work that has a very high level of production, takes years to make, 
and then at the same time thinking about what, what it has done for us to have a very process-oriented place where we can talk about what the work is. So this work is about making work rather than being the work. And most of the images that we're making or sharing are photographed um, from screens, re-photographed images that are fractures or uh, very, very detailed close-ups or photographed from the screen using a phone. So they're, they're, sna they're, scrap they're scrapbooks, basically, and this is a, a way of, di of journaling or something like that. It's a, it's a very quick way of making something concrete that allows us to advance our ideas in a public space. Um, and I'd like to say one other thing about that, which is that um, in the world of blogs, we were able to create often a kind of intimacy and, uh, in terms of the number of people who were following us or how we knew each other. So many of you may be familiar with the expression of small pieces loosely joined, David Weinberger's earlier formulation of what the web looked like, the open network before they became centralized, or, or, or the current architecture of the web became centralized under large social media forces. And we're trying to recreate that in our existing context. So not, not because it's valuable in itself, but because it actually has gotten us writing again in an online space. Um, so here's the first, uh, the first post. Dear Anton, I've been thinking recently about a person I traveled with some years ago on buses and old turboprops around Kazakhstan. It was January and we traveled for several weeks and in my memory, we were, we were never able to get warm. She was blind or nearly so. Her eyes had no lenses. She could only see light and shadow. She carried a small magnifying glass, and with this, she was able to focus on shapes. She had acquired the magnifier as an adult and was learning to understand what she was seeing image by image. For instance, she was able to see photos of her daughter, but she could not read the expressions on her daughter's face. She carried photos of her around everywhere and showed them to people when we, when we met, taking on faith that she was cheerful and smiling in those pictures. During the time we traveled together to Shymkent, Aktau, Pavlodar, Semipalatinsk, and other cities in Kazakhstan, along icy roads, and in long cold waits in bus stations and airports, we explored the difference between icicles and lamp posts, lamp posts and radio towers, street lights and the full moon. Um, when I wrote that, I didn't know that Anton, for the past five years, had been taking pictures with his camera with no lens. And, uh, and so that moment, you know, when, when you start an experiment with a collaborator, you have no idea if it's going to go well. And we'd only spoken in person twice, so it was kind of like a you know, total experiment. Is this going to work or not? And did we actually have anything to say? And what's interesting about that moment is that it sparked a kind of a debate around conceptual thinking around what it means, what the difference is between looking and seeing. And I think we've heard a lot of those echoes in the last two days, um, a lot of conversations about how images are descriptive, but also, um, also have conceptual forms and lots of different academic language for what that might mean, but I think that's a pretty simple way of describing that. And that tension has been something that we've we've talked about um, throughout our conversation, and it's had an effect on the work we do. So his response, in a comparable way for the last years, I've been making images without a lens, asking a camera to record images for me with an eye that I do not have myself. Nothing in between reality and medium, everything essentially reduced to two-dimensional recorded shapes that I reactively try to understand while relating to the moment that I experienced. And we then continue to share these pictures. Now, when we look at all of the pictures by themselves in a group, I have five minutes? OK. They don't make a lot of sense, because they really only become alive uh, in, the, in the context of the image. So this picture is your animal, the flick tail, its monumental shadow with its confounding spindly legs. If it were a sculpture, it would be made of mottled iron. And since I have only five minutes, I will move on. Um, so what have we found about this process? Um, the first is our attempts to keep a story small, to keep it open 
and to keep it uh, available. Um, one of the big threats that we thought that might happen on Instagram when we used a, an open hashtag that anybody could con theoretically contribute to is that some, somebody might troll us and they might troll us hard and they could have destroyed the project pretty quickly just by doing that. And I hope you guys don't, I mean, you're welcome to, but we also thought maybe somebody would join us, which also hasn't happened. But I think one reason neither, neither of those things has happened is because we both have the roughly 500 or 1,000 people who follow us on Instagram, and those are mostly friends or well-wishers. So like a blog, we've been able to reproduce the sense of community within a larger social milieu. It's open to that larger world, but it is not being um, like exhaustively tracked by it. And we haven't made a strong effort uh, to share it much beyond those, that world. We've written one or two stories about it, but mainly the whole idea has been to keep it small and keep it communal. Um, another thing that's been um, interesting is our ability to make something quickly and put it into the world and move on. When you work on projects that take years, you can completely get lost in the space of like, what is this and why is it gonna take me forever to should make something that I can show anybody at all. And this is a really healthy anecdote to those longer waveforms of process. Um, the last thing is, I mean, not the last thing, there's a lot of other things that are going on, but um, given the time, I'll, I'll just mention a few things that we've done as a result of this conversation. So I went to Ukraine. Um, I lived in the former Soviet Union for eight years and, um, lived and worked and traveled all over that part of the world, but it had been a long time since I'd been back. And as a result of this conversation, I decided to go um, to the city of Mariupol, right at the front line between the Ukrainian and, and um, Russian um, conflict, and photograph there. Um, I also wound up visiting war museums all over Europe and photographing and re-photographing um, filmed uh, films that are that are project for World War II films that are in museums as a way to think about other forms of memorialization. So I've got now thousands of captures from, um, from those museums, and that's just been kind of an inquiry. And uh, I, I need to talk to the copyright people about whether or not I can show these pictures. <laughs> but my claim is that I've, conf I've, I've substantially changed them because there's a lot going on, but we'll see. Um, and uh, the last thing, um, given the time, is that um, Anton had, a, through a trip, on a trip through Italy, passed by Carrara, which is the source of marble for uh, David's Michelangelo and many other large monuments and uh, wrote a piece that says, this single mountain cut piece by piece since Roman times is the invisible center point of all that mankind wanted to celebrate. Yet the mountain itself, dying a slow death of a thousand cuts, suffers silently, losing almost a million tons a year. So we went to Carrara together and we spent a week photographing the mountain's topography exhaustively in the round. Um, that will, uh, is now becoming the basis for a new conceptual work. Um, and the structure of that work is, that's, a, that's the topography of the mountain. The structure of that work is that as we were doing this, we discovered that, mar that modern statuary is made um, sort of like the inverse of a 3D printing process. Um, first you start with a tomographic image of marble, so you make a, you make a mod model, take pictures of that model, and then run it through a software program called Photoscan and then you create a digital tomographic image of the marble mapping the, ax the X, Y, and Z axes of the, of the object you're going to make. And then a robot carves it after you've programmed it. And uh, this has given us, uh, and so at this point we're thinking about carving this mountain in marble. And uh, that's the future. So, thank you.